Okay, I will call the meeting of the Green Bay Development Authority to order. Uh, roll call. Uh, Sikich is here. Alderman Dwayne is excused. Uh, Hilgenberg? Here. Parrish? Here. Borley? Here. Genrick is excused. And Raggy? Here. Okay, uh, is there a motion to approve the agenda? Second by Parrish, second by Borley. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Carried. Uh, is there a motion to approve the minutes from our August 19th, 2017 meeting? So moved. Moved by Parrish. Is there a second? Second. Second by Borley. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Carry. Aye. Okay, new business. Consideration with possible action on term sheet with Schwabi North America for Nature's Way development at 954 Erie Road, parcel 21-172-2, and 1024 Erie Road, parcel 21-174-4. The authority may convene in closed session pursuant to sections 19.85, para 1, para E, Wisconsin statutes for purposes of deliberating and negotiating the sale of public properties, investing of public funds, or conducting other specified public business as necessary for competitive or bargaining reasons. The authority may thereafter reconvene an open session pursuant to section 19.85 parent 2 as God's statutes to report the results of the closed session and consider the balance of the agenda. All right. Okay. And yes, that closed session language is available if you want to go in. Um, in, in short, this is a, um, a piece of property we've been talking about for quite some time, but a, a project that we've been talking about more recently, the last few months. Uh, in short, Schwabi North America, you probably know them as Nature's Way. Uh, would like to build a new production facility um, on part of our parcel. They would purchase our parcel along with some additional pieces of property. Uh, 70,000 <coughs> square foot production facility, uh, 35 jobs to start. Um, and again, the reason they chose this property is, is one, the proximity to their location, but also to the potential for some longer term expansion. Um, just through our discussions, I think it's really important for us to note that um, you know, even though they are in the neighborhood, this was the result of a nationwide site selection. I mean, they, they did go through and then look at you know where if we could put it anywhere in the country it would be the best spot to put this, and um, you know work with them to make sure that this would be their their selection. Um, so with that, the, the reason that the term sheet is here is because um, part of the um, terms and conditions would involve us selling our piece of land, which is uh, owned by the city. So EDA here making a recommendation. Um, to, to enter in that transaction, um, so it would be to sell our piece of property for seven hundred thousand dollars, and that would be originally it was one parcel. Uh, we had a previous client work through and divided into two parcels. Um, but those would be nine fifty four and ten twenty four Erie Road. Uh, so those are the parcels that were identified in the map uh, that was sent out. Um, so part of uh, there's a recommendation here to recommend council approve. Um, would with that would be us consenting to that sale as part of it. Um, just in terms of uh, a little bit more about the project, um, in terms of moving forward, um, looking at when all is said and done, probably about a $19 million assessed value project um, that does not include some uh, good money that we're spending on equipment out there for that production facility. Um, and again, I said probably bringing 35 new jobs to start. Um, so with that, um, you know, we recommend uh, that you recommend to council to uh, approve the term sheet uh, and then consent to uh, our sale of, of land for $700,000. Uh, I guess primarily for Phil and Muhammad, um, Mike and I and Pam were here at the last minute meeting, Eric at the last meeting. We pretty much discussed just about all of this. Yeah, we were negotiating, and so we talked a lot we about it in closed session. And a lot of that was in closed session, and this is pretty much the result of those discussions, and uh, I was very pleased to see how it all turned out. Um, but I guess, Phil or Muhammad, if you have any specific questions on this, um, uh, otherwise I'm very comfortable with you know approving this. Um, just one question. Sure. Uh, the initial building and the future building expansion, the, could you just... Sure. So initially, they would like to do a production facility of about 70,000 square feet. Um, where they'd like to see this go is if things are successful with that production, they want to have the ability to expand that facility. Um, and they don't quite have the timetable yet, but in the near future. Um, and, and the reason we kind of blocked off the site is to say, look, if, if we really hit on all cylinders, could we build out to really what we need, would need long term? And, and the answer is yes, and it would fit on the site. 
uh, you know, potentially several hundred thousand square feet. Um, and, and I think those are some of the conversations that they've had, you know, both with us, um, you know, both with the DNR in, in terms of the, the land use and, and permitting and, and um, stormwater management, wetlands. Um, and so they feel like this is a good fit both for them now and in the future. So right now the commitment, um, you know, is just for the 70,000 square feet, but it, they wouldn't buy this unless they had plans to, to do some of that expansion in the near future. Any other questions? I got some comments, but I'll... Yeah, I think I, I trust your expert opinion <laughs> since uh, I'm new and you've discussed this before. Yes. And, yeah, I, I guess I don't have anything to add. I would just say that since uh, this plant will create jobs mm -hmm. and that's what we need here in Green Bay, so did I don't have any problem. Sure. Did they throw in any... Out, any like future potential for jobs or anything um, they, besides the 35 they, or whatever? They did not. The, um, the, the representative from CRBE um, is out of Chicago, so he wasn't able to be here today. Okay. Um, he stated one of the things is, is it kind of depends on just kind of how this first ramp up mm -hmm. goes mm -hmm. um, and, and really what they've been looking at uh, in terms of mostly production jobs with mm -hmm. average about forty two to $50,000 salary. So mm -hmm. in terms of, um, you know, some uh, Good jobs, but then also just in, in a cluster of, you know, we're a food production area and, and food manufacturing and processing, you know, kind of adds into our cluster and we've got a good supply chain here for that. Um, so that's part of the reason also for, you know, wanting to stay in this. Right. So will it be more food production? This will be a, a production facility, and, and that's always one a little harder to judge in terms of. Um, you know, with production and automation, I mean, how many jobs come with that compared to the facility? Uh, one of the things, though, that they, they are um, going to retain their existing facility in uh, I-43 Business Park. Um, so in terms of the offices and then support staff that are there, that's going to stay. And they actually may be looking at some expansion even there with that office as well. And, and did we say the last time, <coughs> excuse me, that um, if they weren't to locate here and they locate somewhere else, their current facility may also would possibly be gone, or um, did they not? Possibly, not necessarily. Okay, okay. Yeah, okay. yeah but just in terms of, I think, just the, the long term or, yeah. um, you know, an additional, like I said, production facility, but other support jobs right. or other things that would come with that, those wouldn't be created here. Okay. I have one last question. How many jobs did you say it's going to uh, To start, 35. Mm -hmm. The... Um, just a couple of quick comments. I know we, Gary and I discussed earlier there's a couple of questions for if you're looking at that presentation at, in, in the packet. Um, there's no tax base listed because the city owns it so we don't tax ourselves. So that's why there's zero uh, amounts. Caught me on a, agenda. Yeah. <laughs> agenda <laughs> How does that work? How does that work? Uh, in agenda like, uh. <laughs> four and five really coincide so yeah. based on or there's an assumption on my part that those other parcels are locked up. The city has that. Yes, and I'd like to discuss that when we get to, right. to five. So yes. with regards to this, when you look at the two together, and if in fact that, that amount of money was spent, I'm just getting to a justification mm -hmm. for what we're doing here. If we do 700 and it seems that we're gonna give $400,000 potentially back, which leads to a three hundred thousand dollar sale price mm -hmm. when you calculate it out. Mm -hmm. It still equates to a little over ten thousand dollars an acre that we're selling it for. When you take the square footage of the existing properties, mm -hmm. the uh, almost two and a half acres of the other two parcels, and package it together, mm -hmm. that's just a hair over thirty acres at three hundred thousand. So mm -hmm. you're about ten thousand. So you. It's not like we're giving the farm away in the sense that we're giving it all away. So there's justification where we're, we're making about ten grand an acre. Correct. So um, and just with that, one of the caveats that we would look at is the seven hundred thousand dollars. That is the sale price mm -hmm. um, because of the way that this was purchased. We would that would go into levy funds. The four hundred thousand dollars that we would use to make the acquisitions, uh, we would recommend coming out of the TID since this oh, is a okay, development incentive. Yeah, okay, yeah. So just in terms Good. of, I, I yeah, mean, it's a, it's a net three hundred, yeah. but really, I mean, we're kind of talking about two different pools yeah, yeah. Um, because I think in terms of the reason for the development, I mean, that's why the TID is out there to use that money for doing that. So I, I just wanted to be clear, and maybe I didn't clarify in here that 
net 300, but but really kind of two different pools. So 700 for the levy, but 400 expense out of the TID. So we make a motion to approve. Oh, oh sorry. Yep. I'm sorry. You know, there might be some resistance to that price at 10,000 an acre, but as I because that sounds like a really low price, mm -hmm. but when looking at the quality of the land and the and the costs associated with developing it, mm -hmm. um, that's a huge factor into it, exclusive of the benefits of the mm -hmm. the other benefits of the development. Mm -hmm. and, you know, personally, I'm, I'm in favor of it. I think it's a, a good accomplishment. Okay. I, I make a motion to approve. A second. Motion made by Borley, seconded by Hilgenberg. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Carry. Very good. Item five, consideration with possible action on purchase and sale agreements for 926 Erie Road, parcel 21-171, and 1038 Erie Road, parcel 21-171-1. The authority may convene in closed session pursuant to sections 19.85, parent 1, parent E, Wisconsin statutes, for the purposes of delivering or negotiating the sale of public properties, investigate, investing of public funds, or conducting other specified public business as necessary for competitive or bargaining reasons. The authority may thereafter reconvene an open session pursuant to section 19.85, parent 2, Wisconsin statutes, to report the results of the closed session and consider the balance of the agenda. So, so yes, <coughs> as uh, Mr. Broly indicated, I mean, these two items, four and five, are, are kind of closely together. Mm -hmm. um, this would involve, as part of our obligations that we've stated in the term sheet, uh, purchasing two properties that are adjacent to the um, property in, in question. Um, the, the two, one is 926 Erie Road, that's the one up at the corner of Mason and Erie. Um, we really feel that's really the most critical piece in terms of that's got the, the front edge in, in terms of our, our two busiest streets. Um, and then the other is 1038 Erie Road, which is at the, the southeastern end of kind of the parcels in question. Um, 926 Erie Road it, it is vacant, it's open, it's available, um, and it's ready to move. Um, 1038 Erie Road is actually an occupied residential house. Um, so one of the things in, in terms of, of, of timing uh, with this, uh, Ken has been working to secure us um, offers to purchase on those properties. So uh, information that was in the packet, uh, but now is available now, and, and I think we can discuss now that this is public. Um, as far as 926 Erie Road, mm -hmm. um, I think we are just one initial away from uh, an accepted offer of $225,000. Um, that would give us the parcel on the corner 926. And then for uh, 1038, um, we have a verbal commitment at 130, $130,000. Hmm. Um, so that, am I correct in that? Yeah, that's okay. the number. Um, so we're still in negotiation. Okay. okay. So with those two, um, those would be the, the prices that we would look at. Um, if we were to move ahead with this, um, I would just change the recommendation. Um, authorized staff to execute purchase and sale agreements for these two parcels with a total price not to exceed $400,000 for both pieces. Um, I think that just gives us a little bit of, of wiggle room. Um, like I said, I think we kind of went into this before and then part of the thing that we put in the offer is look, it's contingent upon approval by you and city mm -hmm. council mm -hmm. to move forward. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would recommend, and then it's up to you if you want to make this contingent or not, um, with the 926 Erie Road piece, the parcel on the corner, um, if we are using TID funds for this to move ahead, regardless of the prior term sheet, um, I think just in terms of, it, it, for some reason, this project, the Erie Road project, the Nature's Way project would fall apart. I think another big project that would come through would probably want to see that parcel oh, secured. Yeah, um, it yeah. just rounds up the corner mm -hmm. and also it gives us more options in terms of if we were to divide this parcel in the future, being able to price that out with some additional land. Um, so I, I would just make sure that, you know, in the discussions, if, if you're okay with that, to, to indicate that. Um, and if not, just let me know just so I know in terms of that this would be contingent upon either going through or you'd like to do it regardless. Regardless, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <coughs> um, I think we'd like to do it regardless. Well, the cat's kind of out of the bag with regards to those two parcels now. Yeah. So I think you really yeah. want to yeah. move forward with tying that in. Right. Again, to secure, that's a corner of a big parcel like you stated. And 
I believe the original listing for that piece was 275 on the corner. Um, I want to say it was more. Last I had 300,000. Oh, I first right. talked to them mm -hmm. and they had reduced it to 250. Oh. Yeah. And so, yeah. I can't sweet talk to job. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Personally, I think those are very high prices, but, but um, the city should own. When you, when you combine them with the other yeah, parcels, yeah, I mean, yeah, that, that yeah. corner piece kind of makes yeah, the rest of the piece know, more valuable. They know that too. It's just <laughs> right. Yeah. But it's a, it's a timing yeah. issue. They knew sooner or later, sure. like, yeah. Yeah. one thing. But I feel like that's a, a fair enough price. Well, the, the numbers you say. Oh, it works. works. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I, think, I think the motion should be that, you know, we purchase those regardless of what happens. The other and, well, actually, right now, the way it's, isn't it, uh, on the agenda, it's just uh, consider yeah. a possible action purchase of those two parcels. Right. And I would just add, um, just to, to move forward, you know, with the price not to exceed 400000 right. I think that right. just provides a cap sure. on us when, right. you know, council ultimately approves that we're not just writing a blank check for the right. price. Okay. Okay. I would entertain a motion for item five. So moved. Uh, Second. Uh, moved by Parish, okay, to uh, for the uh, possible action and purchase of those parcels not to exceed four hundred thousand dollars. So I think you want to. Do we want to add that the, the purchase would continue irregardless of the previous and agenda? Purchase continue irregardless of the uh, Schwabi development. Yeah, I think it's important to get on the record that that's the direction right. Right. you'd like us to take. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Carried. Very good. It's a nice project. It's good. I mean, it's I know nice we've been uh, talking about that piece yeah, for yeah. two years. It's nice to see things start slowly yes. moving out in that direction. Yep, and a good business and yeah, good project. Okay, informational item, items. No, item six, be bold three presentation by Competitive Wisconsin, Inc. Thank you very much. You're up. Yeah, well, I appreciate it. And uh, I'll, I'll try to keep it to 20 minutes. Okay. Um, I really do appreciate the opportunity. Uh, it's good to see government at work. Uh, and I, my hat is off to all of you. Uh, I'm Jim Wood. I serve the Strategic Council to Competitive Wisconsin and the Bebo Council who run these things. For those of you not familiar with Competitive Wisconsin, it's an organization that was founded in 1981 in the midst of what was then the worst recession since the Great Depression. Uh, and it was put together by business, academic, agriculture, and labor leaders and government folks on the grounds that there needed to be a safe harbor someplace where folks could come together and talk collaboratively about what we could do to advance the state, and particularly in difficult periods of time. It has spent the last 36 years dedicated to that premise, uh, and we operate on a pretty simple premise. It is that good public policy should be based on sound research and a lot of public outreach and a lot of public engagement. Uh, since 2010, we have run a series of initiatives under the label Be Bold, uh, and essentially it is, that's a research exercise coupled with, and I'll show you this in a minute, research and outreach and building constituencies and collaborations around recommendations, but it is also driven by the idea that change is with us on a daily basis these days, and that if you're gonna do that, you really don't have time for folks to stick their heads in the sand. And so somebody has to be out there thinking about the systemic, the broader pieces. We are diametrically opposed to competing with local and regional exercises. We are in the business of trying to figure out how to augment and encourage and, and supplement those ideas. So let me talk about Accelerate Wisconsin. This is the third one. The first one we did was focused on strategic economic development. We recommended the creation of the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation and a variety of other things that came out of that. The second Be Bold was focused on the skill gap problem and we believe we contributed significantly to the Fast Forward program and to the creation of the academic career plan uh, exercises that are going on in the schools. Having done two fairly controversial exercises, we thought it would be a good idea to focus on something that was working as opposed to something that was not working. Um, and so we decided we wanted to identify two major clusters in Wisconsin's private sector that were doing well, that were creating jobs, that, were, that looked sustainable, looked like they could go someplace. Um, and they determined what, if anything, we could do in Wisconsin to make sure they could perform even better. And 
and therefore would want to stay in the state. So that was the, the charge, and our goals are always higher per capita income, strong sustainable talent goals, enhanced ability to get products to market, and maximize responsible use of resources. I mentioned that this is a process piece, okay? And the process is committed to making sure we get input, that we've got solid research, that it is done in a collaborative fashion, um, that there is outreach, and most importantly, ultimately, that we get results. We're about to, we've spent two years on this particular exercise. We think we've got some very good recommendations, and the next step here is for both of the major clusters to take over our recommendations and see that they process through the legislative process. But let me just quickly go through it. So the first thing we do is that we identify an issue. We are always looking for a high profile, high impact issue uh, for all sorts of different reasons. We then hire uh, professional research organizations like Deloitte or Manpower or the UW or whatever it may be to do the research. When that preliminary research is finished, we engage in a series of preliminary briefings, and that means I go around the state, others go around the state. And I've probably in the last four and a half, five years done 60 briefings with regional economic development folks. These meetings are all normally co-hosted by the local UW campus, the local technical campus, usually a chamber of commerce, et cetera, gets involved in that process. That in turn leads to the initial Be Bold report, and that in turn, at that juncture, we can be in a strategic planning group made up of the folks whose ox is getting gored by or who would benefit from the work that we're doing. Uh, and in the last, with this exercise, we've engaged more than 200 individual institutions, organizations, trade associations, whatever, in these different strategic planning exercises. Their job is to take all of that research and think about it in terms of them as the client and say, well, this is what we would recommend based upon all of this research. We take that information and go out and do what I'm doing right now, which is wandering around the state again like Johnny Apple uh, and talking to folks about it. We then take everything we got from that process and produce a series of economic summits around the state, usually three of them. Uh, we come out of that and then produce a final B Bolduck report. So as you can see, whatever it is we're talking about, lots of folks have had a kick at the cat. It's pretty well grounded, we think. And what we discover is the first time you say it, it sounds really bold. If you spend six months to a year of wandering around talking to people, they say, oh, I've heard about that. And it gets better. At that juncture, we start, once again, we brief legislators all the way through this process. We normally meet with the governor two or three times while we're going through this process. But now, as I said, we turn it over to the clients and they in turn focus on turning it into a legislative package. So, as I said, we started out with the question of what's working. We went to the University of Wisconsin <coughs> System in UW-Madison. They undertook a major exercise to see what the fastest growing industries were in terms of jobs. Fastest growing industry in terms of jobs in the state of Wisconsin's bars and restaurants. Uh, no great surprise, but it's not exactly higher per capita income. It's an entry level job. So, we went to the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation in Deloitte and said, we want you to run a series of additional economic screens on this, and they went through all sorts of stuff, all of which you can find on our website, and if you really are looking for a headache, the reams and reams of screens <coughs> that you can go through. Uh, and they ran all these different screens, and we picked up all the work that Manpower had done for us in Bebo too, in terms of skill clothing, et cetera. Out of that, we identified food processing or food manufacturing and healthcare as the two major clusters that we were gonna look at and our objectives enhancing workforce and talent development, and growing the jobs and businesses, not just of today, but of the future. In that process, when we brought everybody together, and so we got to that point, and we then convened a meeting with leaders of the food manufacturing and food processing industry in Madison, Wisconsin, and we said to them, we want to hear the normal stuff, okay, which is the cost of doing business, all of that kind of stuff. But we are getting increasingly concerned, and this is a couple of years ago, we are getting increasingly concerned about workforce shortages and all of those kinds of issues. And so we think relatively soon the state's going to be concerned about recruiting people and retaining people. And that's a different set of questions than just the question of the cost of doing business. And the third thing that is really emerging around the country, if you're looking for places where things are working, there is a shift in paradigm in terms of the relationship between the public and private sector. 
if you're looking for places where it's really starting to come together, quite honestly, the New North area is one of those areas where you can point to it and, and show specific examples. Business and government come together, private and public sector come together to solve problems. Everybody, everybody this state's got more boards and commissions than God, okay? Mm -hmm. And and I, my hat's off to all of them, but the bottom line is that's not what they do. They're set with responsibilities, et cetera. We need folks who come together and say, this is how we're going to solve this problem. This is what we need to do in this particular circumstance. So we said we're going to do three analytical cuts at the cost of doing business, the cost of living, uh, and, and recruitment, et cetera, strategic synergies and collaborations. So where we are now is we now have two full reports, one on food manufacturing and one on health care. And I'm going to dance across these really quickly. Both the, the, the food processing report is now posted in its print version on the competitive web Wisconsin website, and you can go and look at that. You can also get to the original preliminary briefings and all the research, and et cetera. So let me quickly go through that. You're familiar because you are a food processing area. You're familiar with how important food processing and manufacturing is in the state of Wisconsin. Paul Pomley is the chief operating officer. Seneca at our very first meeting, however, made a point I always want to make. He said, never forget that we are here because the farmers are here. And the farmers are here because the soil is good and the water is spectacular. Access to water is a critical piece of this economic paradigm. And so nobody wants to screw around with the environment. We need to be careful to make sure that farmers can continue to access the water. So when we talk about all these things, that is a major issue. Uh, I, as I said, I'm going to. Th these are these slides violate every rule of PowerPoint and everything else because there'd be way too much text mm -hmm. on it. But it's the simplest way I know to summarize what we're looking at. They met. They met, and then their original premise. They said, "Okay, here are the issues that are bothering us," and they kind of generically talked about workforce as a major issue. They talked about inconsistency in regulation as an issue. And we said, what exactly does that mean? And they said, our problem is not that there's a gap between the feds and the state and the local. Our problem is it depends upon who you're talking to in a given agency and whether they're in Madison or they're someplace else and whether or not they're a new employee or they've been around long enough. And that's a major problem for us in Wisconsin because you cannot attract major capital to a regulatory environment that's unstable. Nobody in their right mind is going to put 50 to 100 million dollars into a new plant that they're not sure they'll be able to operate efficiently over the next 15 to 20 years. They have to have some sort of window on that. So that's a relatively big deal. And then their third issue uh, was infrastructure and lack of public understanding of the industry and what that all takes. So Deloitte ran that session for us. We asked them, identify for us three states where you think the kinds of issues that are bugging you here are being dealt with, okay? I'm not interested in best practices as much as I am in where's the cutting edge, who's ahead of the curve on these kinds of things. And they identified New York, Colorado, and Texas. So we hired Deloitte. Deloitte went to Texas, New York, and Colorado and interviewed top food executives and trade association folks in those three states. It is interesting to note that not in one of those states was workforce shortage or talent identified as a problem. Not in one of those states was permitting identified as a problem. Okay. So with that in mind, the problem in the regulatory box that we talked about is that existing regulations do not adequately reflect scientific and applied technological advances. There's a growing concern that in the midst of this change that our the language we have in the books is based on science and technology that's somewhere between 10 and 20 years old. We, like most states, have review language that says you're supposed to look at this, but we don't. I mean, it's just, you know, who wants to go and have the fights and who wants to do all of that kind of stuff. Second problem is there's a lack of alignment between the new science and technology that leads to inconsistent interpretation of the existing regulations. Right now, what you've got is a lot of folks retiring well, in every profession. So you got some of that happening in the food process industry, but you got a lot of it happening in state government. Okay? And so all of a sudden, and I don't mean this as an insult to people, but you got young folks coming straight out of a college background, and they've got all the book learning they need, and they've got some field experience, but they don't they don't know all of this stuff. Okay, and so 
the companies are hiring the very professors who taught them in many cases to do major research projects to talk about how do you handle wastewater, how do you do these kinds of issues, and then all of a sudden it's in front of this person that doesn't understand all of that stuff and the law isn't clear because it's based upon this old language. So that's a problem. And as I said, the inconsistent interpretation discourages capital investment and expansion in Wisconsin. Just so I can give some credibility to that, one of the things we're doing with this project that is new this time around is we've got executives, we went to Wisconsin and I, and we taped an hour program on each one of these recommenda recommendation blocks. So the workforce, the regulate, regulation, the infrastructure piece. And so we had people from the dairy, nature dairy industry, from the Cheesemakers Association, from the food processors, the uh, best food processors. And I was astounded at how frank and blunt they were. So a guy who's the vice president for operations of Breakbush says he's been introduced, interviewed by Steve Walters. And Steve said, so, but you just did a, uh, an expansion in, in Westfield, so you must be happy. And, and Rusty said, well, yeah. He said, we did a $40 million expansion in Westfield. He said, but we did a $100 million expansion in Texas. And Steve said, why? He said, because I'm not sure I can get the workers here, and because quite honestly, the regulatory process takes too long here and is, is not stable. And we had eight or nine executives and trade association people. Bang, 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 and you'll see that somewhere down the road when it gets on the, uh, the television set. So what did we recommend? The challenge out of all of that, well, it's essentially the big challenge was how do you stabilize the regulatory environment? And the answer is you try to you begin to deal with that discrepancy between the science, the technology, and the language, okay? But that won't get you where you need to go unless you can change the mindset. It has to be about partnerships. It has to be about mutual interest. And it has to be about trust. And ultimately, it has to be about outcomes and how you put it together so that it will sustain itself. So what we've recommended is establishing a periodic cluster-based collaborative review. A lot of language in there. And I'll, I'll send this to you. You can read it, or you can go and read the whole report. In essence, what we're saying, there are 17 private sector clusters in the state of Wisconsin. So if we took four of them every year and said, this is your turn to redo your language based upon the science and technology, that would give us roughly a four-year cycle in which you would, every, every fourth year, fifth year, you would start a process in which you would take a look at what the regulatory language was, where the science was, where the technology was, what other people were doing. And I'd maybe either show it this way. So you would, you, would, you don't even know how we get the, who we pick first. But the bottom line is, you put together a cluster of collaborators. And so it's the industry folks, it's the regulatory body, it's legislators, it's investors, it's the whole ball of wax. Whoever they think they're going to need in that box. They come together, and in the first year, they take a look at the existing language, the existing regulations, and there'll be money in this. The industry, you know, my, my, our preference is we'll match whatever state dollars we can get to put in there so that we can hire you know, researchers and, and get this done correctly. The job is to spend that first year and say, here's where we're out of alignment, here's where we're out of alignment, here's where there's an opportunity, and so on across the board. The end of that first year, you go into the second year, whoops, excuse me, you go into the second year. No problem with this stuff. In the second year, you develop preliminary recommendations based upon what you found out in the first year. And again, we're doing this over a longer period of time, so once again, people have a chance to take kicks to the cat. Nobody gets to say, I didn't have time to do the research, and so on and so forth. In year three, based upon you're now doing feasibility studies and analysis, and based upon the recommendations you're going to make, you're also talking about workforce training, you're doing a variety of other kinds of things, and you're talking to the investment community, and in year four, you're in front of the legislature with what we would hope is an agreed upon bill. Okay? And the premise, we, uh, this is, it's not like this is an alien model. Wisconsin has had a, work, has a, had a workers' comp group that for over 50 years has produced an agreed upon bill. Better sometimes than other times, and this is more complicated than that. But again, we're saying this is let's start this process and see if we can get there. There's one other important piece in here, uh, and that is that 
uh, in order to maintain the stability for that cluster over that four-year period of time, one of the jobs of the, of the collaboration would be to appoint an expert advisory panel that would serve for a four-year period of time. And anybody during that four-year period of time can appeal to that expert for a really, for export board for a ruling on whether or not that's what the language means. So now you're not just dependent upon the agency, but the agency is also not just dependent upon whatever the client may bring through the door. And we think both of those factors uh, do some serious stabilization pieces and we think they have some real value. Uh, that is a, that's a bold proposal and we understand it will require massive legislative engagement to get where we need to go. The second piece that we came away from looking at Colorado, Texas, and New York was that we need to enhance cross-agency and cross-institutional focus on and understanding and effective support of major cluster industries. Each of those states, um, well, let me do it this way. So the food manufacturers report the Wisconsin permitting process is too time consuming and redundant when it comes to requiring multiple engineering reviews and approvals. This is the kind of stuff that drives them crazy. Just so you, you probably understand this, but the bottom line is most of these folks when they want to do a plant expansion or update them or whatever, they have to get an engineering report. Okay? But the DNR has its own engineer. And so after you get a certified professional engineer who has said that this thing will do everything it's supposed to do, you now take it to the DNR and you've got another 30, 60, 90 day delay while that engineering process goes on the the DNR is approving it, and during that process, you can get called for another public hearing, you can get called for all sorts of things. All of the folks we talk to in terms of the food manufacturing business have operations in multiple locations in the country. This is not their only base of support. And so they have comparisons, and they are constantly living in a world But when they go to meet with their investors, they go to the board, they're saying, why are you, why are you, why are you gonna do it there? opposed to doing it someplace else. Now, that's not an argument. Can I make a comment real quick on that? Pardon? So some of our engineering companies have the, um, yeah. they hold the approval so that their approval is the DNR approval. They have a, there's a base, there's a certification that they hold. And that is, if it's, if it's done by one of the certified engineers, then it doesn't have to have a DNR review. And that, and we need and that. that does help. So I've had a couple of projects expedited via And that's that what we're recommending. That's one of the things we're recommending, is that okay. that needs to be system-wide as opposed to, it needs to be the rule as opposed to the exception to the rule. That's From what I understand, there's quite a few companies in the area that do do that. So it's nice that when they said, who are you working with? And we can provide that it was a certified, then the DNR just takes the information and files it. And what, they, and what our people will tell us, and I'd be interested in what your engineers say, is, I mean, we talked to, large cable managers and we talked to large other kinds of folks who said it depends upon that works only under certain circumstances it depends what kind of project you're doing mm -hmm. so and again i'm not arguing with you because i'm sure you're right but um, just the examples of i think like uh, in wisconsin you know for like building plans you have to go through a laborious right. process to get them approved in michigan the Architect, if they stamp it, approved, it's basically approved. And the onus is on the architect and the engineers that they did their job properly. And it's a huge, it, I mean, it's huge. And again, I, you know, I think the issue is, it, it, nobody's saying one's right and the other's absolutely wrong, but, it, but we ought to be able to bring those or two things together and say, what do you need so that you're comfortable? What do I need so that it's more Have some checks and balances, yeah. but. Yeah, right. So essentially, all three of the states that we looked at have, it's an unfortunate choice of words, but they have what they call a concierge system. Okay? And the major difference is that in a concierge system, there is somebody in state government whose job it is to understand that cluster. Not just to serve the cluster or jump up and down for it, but to literally understand the market that the cluster is working in, what their labor costs are, what their construction costs are, what normal kind of procedures are, and to be, and to use that knowledge to help other agencies and other folks in state government to understand how, what that means in terms of making people feel comfortable and welcome and all the rest of that. 
When WEDC was formed, there was a lot of discussion about should they do something like that or should they do field reps, more field rep kind of engagement. And the decision made was made to do field rep engagement. Not opposed to that, um, but I do think this needs uh, some, some or merits some very real examination and some looks. Okay? Uh, there's also a call then, uh, in terms of the workforce recommendations, I'm pushing my time frame here. How can I get this any quicker? Okay. So, in, there's a gigantic recognition of the shortage problem that's coming, and the understanding of the shortage problem is because we got a shrinking workforce and an aging population, the real downside on all of this is not just that you can't get enough of workers, it is that your tax base starts to erode. And as the tax base starts to erode, you can't maintain the infrastructure, and you can't maintain your schools and your health care and everything else, and that becomes a problem in terms of both retention and recruitment. And so both clusters have called for a private sector driven effort to develop a systemic workforce recruitment and retention report. We aren't making this public yet, but next month Competitive Wisconsin will announce that we are doing that study, and so we'll be taking that on pretty quickly. Um, that said, uh, the other issue that came up was they have major problems with the public schools in terms of certain kinds of workforce feeder systems, pipelines, kinds of things. Um, and they made a series of recommendations here. Probably the most controversial one is we had um, a number of school district superintendents and CESA people involved, and they said finally in great frustration, they said, well, you don't get it. I said, what do you mean we don't get? They said, well, we don't get paid to prepare students for the workforce and for the community. We said, well, wait a minute. No, they said, we understand that we should, that that's our responsibility. But when you look at how the budgets are put together, it does not specify. We get paid to teach kids how to read, how to do math, and how to, that's what they get tested on. And that's where the dollars go. So the most controversial recommendation in here is probably to clarify that language in the state budget to say it is the responsibility of the K-12 system to be engaged with the local community and the local economy and there need to be some dollars behind that, not to, to do an unfunded mandate, but to talk about what that ought to look like. And so the premise there is not that it would be a mandate. The premise is that we would, over a period of time in a collaborative exercise, try to figure out what kind of language that ought to look like. Some of the CESA districts are already down the path on that. So CESA 6, for example, has done some stuff. There's a lot of other stuff in here that says you need to spend some time looking at teacher training exercises. Probably the other largest piece on this particular piece is that the private sector has got to become more engaged with the educational infrastructure. You can't just stand on the sidelines and keep pointing your fingers. We have a unique opportunity because of the career academic plan. For the first time in history, we have students who are taking tests and creating data about what they think their skills are and what they might like to do, et cetera. We don't get their names, but we can get the collective data about whether that the workforce in your school district actually might have an interest in the kinds of jobs you have in your community, and also whether or not you have, in terms of teaching skills, the kinds of teachers you need in there. The private sector needs to engage with that data and then engage with the schools and be considerably more engaged at the curriculum level, at the instructional level, at the, at the visit to the schools, at the intern level. A lot of opportunity there. So there's a lot of stuff like that. Uh, the there's other a mandatory, problem. Mandatory, real quick. There's a mandatory thing I think for the state, but I know that it's in, implemented in Green Bay that all of the kids have to have where they do the career cruising. I don't know if you're familiar with that yep. um, piece where every child goes it's called, to school. It's called Springboard, and that's the yeah. it's a requirement for an academic career plan. Starts. Right. They start early on in what they're interested in and what they're scoring well in, and right. then they kind of help help them choose classes along that line and then hopefully get them into internships or in So there are two pieces of software. One is spring springboard, which is the basic piece for career cruising, and then there's another piece called Inspire, also for career cruising, which allows uh, individual employers in the marketplace to produce a portal that the kids can access and go look and see what kind of jobs they have, what kind of skill sets, et cetera. And, and the employers who do that are encouraged to recruit a couple of mentors in their company who are vetted, can't meet with the kids, but they can answer questions online. And again, it's a great tool, it's a great opportunity, and it is, the system is now statewide. 
so springboard is, is it, it, there's some exceptions or places that use a different kind of uh, software, but the concept is statewide. I think the Thrive stuff or something like that will be statewide pretty quickly. Jim, that's kind of taking the place of uh, youth apprenticeship programs, it sounds like. Of what? The, the, um, it sounds like it's in taking the place of or maybe coexisting with the youth apprenticeship programs in the state. Yeah, I think I think the plan is that, th that they need to come together and inform each other. Okay? And it is, you know, so we, not to go far afield here, but, but um, good apprenticeship programs are hard on the private sector. We don't have the bodies, we don't have the money, we don't have the skill sets, quite honestly. And so, the question is, unless unless we can redesign that intersection between the school and the private employer in some pretty functional fashion, so we got work to do, I guess, is what I'm saying. The, and what's interesting, in agriculture is one of the cluster areas that's probably done more in this field than anybody else. Monsanto and some of the other companies spent a lot of money, and so there's some good ground stuff out there to deal with. Uh, I'm going to turn the feed back to I'm not going to do you all the healthcare stuff, but I, the last piece I do want to mention is there is concern about the fact that folks aren't taking jobs because of the benefits issue, et cetera. And so we are also recommending here that we change state law to allow new hires to transition gradually from public unemployment and healthcare benefits to employer and private market benefits. Um, I would, I, I will, I'd advise you if you want to dig into this stuff, both the healthcare report will be posted probably next week. The only other thing, let me just show you one other thing that we're going to do to make this easier for you. Um, I'm not going to go through any of the healthcare stuff. I just want to, for the first time, we're going to take these printed reports and try to make them interactive and digital on the internet. Uh, and so we're taking all the video that we've shot as we went through this process, we're having discussions. We'll do everything from hour-long programs to 10-minute podcasts to five-minute factoid kinds of things. And you'll be able, as you go through the report, not there yet, but there'll, any place that's marked, you'll be able to click on it and see, you know, John Whitty talking about the kind of research they did and so on and so forth. And, you know, this is the Be Bold Tree stuff with Wisconsin Eye. So, hopefully more entertaining and, and more useful. Um, I apologize, I went over my 20 minutes. So, um, but what I would say to you is I think this is a critical time in Wisconsin's history, and you guys up here in the New North area have been leading the way on all sorts of fronts, and so hats off to you. I, my personal uh, request is that you, you know, don't hesitate to pick up a phone. I'm gonna be back through the neighborhood a lot of different times. The number one issue, I think, in this state is workforce shortages. Everything else is important, but if we can't begin to recruit workers to come here, and that's a very different process than we're currently engaged in. Green Bay and, and Appleton and the area up here is doing the, uh, what is it, Download Talent or Upload Talent program, which is absolutely a great program, okay? So again, keep at it, but it's not statewide, and it's not, it, it won't get us as far as we think we need to go. If we think that there are other ways to figure out, or there are ways to figure out how to augment that program. So we're going to be out there, and anytime we can come and help, we'd like to do that. So thank One you. The things I noticed uh, this week at the meeting, and that the Jobs Wisconsin um, organization has added an intern page, and there's like 1,100. Um, interns uh, jobs posted and they just got it started. Maybe there's even 11,000, but there's a lot of them posted. So if you have jobs, if you know an employer that has a job oops, website already that they're posting their jobs, they're already members of this and they already can do it, otherwise they can call them and add that. But it's nice because an internship often can have somebody in the area or even if they're in college somewhere else and come back for the summer and want to try something and then it's often a job interview as well at the intern level. Um, they're usually looking for somebody to fill yeah, a and position. And I couldn't agree more, but it has to be part of the... So let me give you an example. We, we have 13 four-year campuses in this state, 13 junior colleges associated with those campuses, and 16 technical colleges. There are 47 advanced education campuses in the state of Wisconsin. Huge resource. 
the largest cost of entry to the marketplace is education. Okay? We've, we've created 11.9 million jobs since the recession, all but fewer than 100,000 have required advanced education. Okay? That's the future. So it makes no sense to me that as we look at that vast educational infrastructure that we have in the state of Wisconsin, that we would, as public policy, say, we have to charge out-of-state students more. Okay. Why aren't we saying, yeah. I don't care what, whatever your state wants to charge you, I'll give it to you for 5% less. And then say to them the freshman year, if you can find a local employer who will look at your career plan and do nothing else but simply say, yeah, this makes sense to me, I'll knock another 5% off your tuition for that year. If in your sophomore year you've got an internship with a local regional employer, I'll knock another 5% off of it. And if you have a job offer before the end of your junior year, I'll take 10% off your senior year. I can make all of that work on a spreadsheet. When you stop thinking about creating jobs and start thinking about creating taxpayers, when you have 9% unemployment, you don't have enough jobs. When you've got 3.5% unemployment and a declining workforce participation rate, you don't have enough taxpayers. And so here's an opportunity to take your educational infrastructure and link it to your economy and find a role for the private sector. Because now, in my company, we, we had interns every year. And I had 40 people in my company. And it was expensive and it was a pain in the butt because there was no coordination. They would just show up and then, you know, I had, I had to assign somebody in the company to be in charge of the interns. And, and, and it was good, and God love them because they're all over the world now and it's fun. But we need a partnership where everybody sees that there's something in it for them. So the campuses do more than simply say, just go get an internship. And the employers do more than say, yeah, go sit over here and do whatever. And so it is, there's a moment in time here that I think is, you're here in my soapbox speech, so I'll stop. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Appreciate your time to come up here and present that. Lots of interesting information. I'm not sure, Jim, if you could do that in an hour. There's so much information yeah, there, but uh, you did a good job. So well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for paying attention. Yeah, I no appreciate problem. it. And thank you again for all the work you do like this. This is important sure. stuff. Item 7, Development Director's Update. Uh, sure. Um, just a few things uh, in terms of what's going on at Redevelopment Authority yesterday. I uh, also moved forward with a development agreement for the East Town Mall. So, um, the timeline has been pushed out a little bit, but uh, look, at least we've got uh, the developer willing to commit to move forward, mm -hmm. um, you know, complement what's going on at Foes and just kind of the general sure. area. Mm -hmm. um, I think that is also being paralleled by next week at Council. Uh, we'll be looking at a creation of a new tax increment district for East Mason, East Town area mm. um, that encompasses the Cub Foods, the East Town Mall, uh, but also some of those other properties within there. Um, you know, we really see it kind of long-term neighborhood center development. There's a lot of parking yeah. out there that's not used well and, and buildings that could be used higher and better. So um, you know, we're hoping that council uh, supports that. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll move forward to getting these projects going, but also you know some future development uh, in there as well. Mm -hmm. Um, as far as uh, just since the last time we met uh, or last council meeting, um, they did move forward with uh, approval of a development agreement for the rail yard, uh, the northern phase so north of Kellogg Street, uh, getting in and then rehabbing warehouses and office space, uh, some potential housing space, and building some additional condos, putting in the infrastructure, and really, um, you know, you've seen what DDL has done south of Kellogg Street, mm -hmm. uh, providing an opportunity to continue that success north of Kellogg Street. Um, and then as far as just some other uh, big projects, um, we're, we're hopeful we'll be talking about the, the shipyard again um, in, in the coming weeks. Um, you know, working behind the scenes just on some of the financing pieces, um, you know, working on the environmental work. I think if you've been out there, you've probably seen um, Fox River Cleanup crew uh, going in to get the PCBs out of the um, slip uh, and then repairing the, the wall uh, on the south side uh, of the slip. Um, getting the parties back together to uh, break through a development agreement and then get that piece moving uh, this fall. Um, and also, just I had to excuse myself, just talking to Alderman Stryer about communication at the uh, HBC uh, about Hotel Northland. Um, looks like uh, court date has been set for October 3rd uh, before the receivership. Um, again, uh, I think one of the concerns they had was, you know, just what 
winter's coming, mm -hmm. creeping along. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and, but I think, look, the, the best thing we can do is just make sure that that process of receivership goes through uh, expeditiously and, and getting people back in there as soon as possible. Um, that way, we know we're not thinking about winterizing it. We're thinking about getting people in there working again and then moving again. So, uh, just I think uh, with that court date, uh, hopefully things can move pretty quickly and, and we'll see workers again there, uh, hopefully in, in November, and then get things going again. Uh, so we can open it next year. Um, with that, I'll be happy to entertain if there's any questions about other specific projects, um, other things to work on. And oh yeah, I also mentioned um, the other day our revolving loan fund and loan program, mm -hmm. we are out of money thanks to Wendy. Oh, so, okay. um, good problem, bad problem. Well, but, always. Right. Yeah, we've taken over a million and a half dollars in the last, what, 18 months? Mm. Down yeah. to zero. So that is money out working in the community. Good. Um, it's busy. So we yeah, have a lot of lot of happy businesses, a lot of mm -hmm. lot of active uh, mm -hmm. employers ready to ramp up and add, and mm -hmm. so that's really a great story to tell. Everyone's for current. And yep, everybody's right on time and doing well and expanding and growing. So that's a great yeah. story to tell. Over the years, we took a few black eyes. Yeah. And <laughs> well, and it's interesting when you look at the history and in, in the, in the of that fund. It started in 1990, two hundred thousand. Block grant money, yep. I think, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. and we've leveraged it to, to over a million. We're closer, almost oh, just two, under two. two so two, yeah, we're yeah, we're, two, we're just under two. Yeah. With twenty companies, I think, approximately twenty. I'm going to actually give you a report. I have it um, started um, um, just because I got busy with some of the underwriting and some other things to try and close these loans on time. There's some. Um, big issues going on with some of the ones that we just approved this week. Um, so, I mean, as far as just there's a lot of moving parts. There's four people in one loan, and there's just, you know, it's a lot of um, uh, breath in that. But um, I'll produce a report next time of how many loans we've done, what sectors, how many jobs were created, and some additional information. So if you want to put that on the agenda yeah. for next time, I'd be happy to um, report out to the uh, committee um, kind of an impact um, study piece, or just report out study, yeah. informational piece. It's always nice to know where, what we've what been we're doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But thank you for summarizing that. I can back it up with some facts. So yes, <laughs> it's been a busy, a busy time for our committee. Thank you for your support. Any other questions? We're good. Motion to adjourn. Moved by Borley is our second. I'll second that. Any further discussion? Mm -hmm. All in favor say aye. Aye. Period. All right. <coughs> Thank you. Well, good. Well, we, uh, yeah. We didn't get yeah, most of the